morning, everybody. Nice to see everybody and momentar momentarily hear everybody. Terry, Travis, Marsha, nice to see all of you. Today, you've joined the Opulent session. Opulent is a red team. By the end of this session, you'll have an understanding of where it's grown, how it's processed, and the quality characteristics as well as the flavor profiles and aroma profiles. So let's start out a little bit with a little bit of news of the shop this week. We have broken down all the boxes of new teas and everything that we're testing is coming in in great shape. We're very excited about what's going on with that. So that's one item. Second item is we keep our eyes on the Chinese market for a number of reasons. First being that the cliff teas aren't done yet. So it's gonna be a bit before they're done. And we're trying to get some inside information in terms of what they're gonna look like this year. And by that, what I mean is we're trying to have an understanding of what the weather is, what unusual things have occurred this year that might affect the crop. Last year, you may remember that green tea was very, very difficult. This year, because we acted very promptly and got the very first pick, the stuff that we've got this year is out of this world and we've gotten a lot of different types this year. So all of that is in really good shape in terms of what we've gotten this year. We've gotten some more white tea. We've got ancient tree white tea. So that's very exciting. Uh, we've got a new uh, green, uh, yellow tea. That's very exciting. So we're continuing to move forward. The tea market in China is extremely frothy right now. So what that means is that everything we've gotten is considerably more expensive just simply because transportation costs, storage costs, the whole works of processing through the FDA plant in China, everything has gone up. So we're also in the process of trying to figure out how to reflect some increase in the prices uh, but we're also trying to see what might be possible for us to absorb as well. We continue to make changes in the website and that you will see shortly because one of the things that's happened as we've tested the website is we've broken up the T's into collections and the collections have made it a little bit more complicated, especially for newcomers to understand what's going on. So we're yet again going through another iteration and it, the end result should look closer to how the original setup of this website was. So in other words, you'll be able to see our whole collection much easier. The second thing we're working on and should have this in place within the next couple of weeks is for the members, the annual members, we're gonna have a separate section. And in that separate section, there'll be some goodies for you. There'll be some things you can explore. So we're very excited about the progress of all of those things. All right, I blathered on enough about the news of this week. Let's go ahead and march right into office. Opulent is from Anhui province. So right away, thinking about Anhui and thinking about red tea, you know that the craft level is likely to be high because red tea has been coming from Anhui for a long time, since the 1700s. And the craft has developed to a very high degree and it's more uniform in Anhui than it is in any other province. So what do I mean by that more uniform? Isn't everybody basically following the same steps 
in the process of making red tea? The answer is the basic steps are all followed. However, there are additional steps, craft steps that in Anhui are quite developed. Actually in Fujian are also quite developed. So that's the first thing. So where in Anhui does this come from? It comes from a place called Xiuning. And Xiuning is very close to the Yellow Mountains in Anhui. And it's actually part of, or borders the Qiman County area. And as such, there is a big influence on the development or the processing of opulent from Qiman needle or Qiman area. So that's one of the things that's really important to know. Secondly, in terms of age of, of bush, these are old bushes and old bushes here means that they run anywhere. Actually, there are small trees now. They're uh, old small trees and the tree tree ages run anywhere from three to 500 years old. So you're getting something that's a little bit more, you, you'll be able to taste that as you go through that. And as you think about what ancient and old almost always apply in terms of tea. So those are kind of some interesting and important things to understand about this tea right from the start. The pick is a leaf and a bud or a leaf and two buds from this. This is a relatively early pick. The elevation of this is also relatively higher. So you're in about the 4,000 feet above sea level, somewhere between 4,000 and 5,000, which means that actually in the winter, because this is also it's central China, but it's north central. That means that you actually do get some cold air, occasional dustings of snow. And when you do that, remembering what that does is it causes the plant to accumulate more amino acids. It reduces, and again, we're talking small numbers, sometimes actually Percentage-wise, it's a significant number, but we're not talking numbers that you and I ordinarily would use in our daily lives. So it increases the amino acids, reduces the chlorophyll, and the end result is that means that this tea will likely have more interesting flavors because when you increase the amino acids, you generally speaking are backing off any of the hay or grassy notes that you ordinarily would have in a tea. And even if it's a red tea, that might, those notes sometimes can be still in there if they're from a different elevation. So this is the setup for this particular tea. Before I move forward, and I should have done this in the beginning. Let's make sure as a group that we're handling our cameras carefully. Make sure that when you move from place to place that your camera is off, that you're, you're not uh, recording anything in your environment. So that's one thing. And then the second thing is, before we get started, because I'm gonna have the, the tea master come up here fairly soon now. The second thing is, I am so delighted today to announce that I have another expert camera person working with us today. And this is an old tea, it's Kay. And she's behind the camera and she'll be catching your questions and giving them to me. So uh, again, thank you very much, Kay. I'm really appreciative of you handling uh, this today. And now I am so very delighted to bring up 
the numinous. I'm wondering if she's thirsty too. Probably thirsty also. <laughs> Team master. Shall they? Yes. Thirsty. They are thirsty. Okay. So, Lena is a whole time. Yeah, it's red. So, I think he, huh? So, if you like copying, uh, sing another, ask another. So use the same tableau, so you notice yes. the three cups. They come. It's easy, right? Yeah. The strainer. The strainer, right? Yeah, section. Okay. So, yeah. So one of the things that's critical about this, and you'll see why we're using three cups is you're going to need to structure the water because this is 170 degrees. It's not 175. And so the master is going to go through a dissipating the steam process as well as heating up the cup. So again, for those of you who are new, heating up the cup is very important for two reasons. The first reason is that it, it gets rid of and gives you a comfort in terms of making tea that it's absolutely clean. There are no soap stains left on it. There's nothing which is going to interfere with your ability to appreciate and understand this tea. That's the first thing. The second thing is, remember, when we go through this process, we're going to also heat up the tea leaves first. You need to do that in order to get the right flavor and aroma profile from this. And you do that by making sure you heat up the cup first. So you can use any temperature of hot water between 212 and 170. And as you dissipate or structure the water, are you in a hurry? The answer is no, you're not in a hurry. And so some of you may be thinking, well, what if it goes down to 168 or 167 or 166 in temperature? Do I have to add more water to get it back up to 170? And the answer is no. You, if, when we err, we always err on the side of cooling. Why again? We air there because you get the driest flavor if something is cooler versus something is hot. When it's hotter, you flat the flavor. So Tea Master has structured the water. She's taken bag or is taking bag number one, labeled opulent, and she pours it into the cup that she just cleared of the hot water. And here's where the fun part comes. Shakes up the tea leaves. Smells them to make sure that, that there's two reasons for smell. One is to, wow, I can smell those all the way over here. That's amazing. Uh, one is to make sure that you got what you think you had. Because as you get used to the teas, you understand what they should smell like. And if for some reason you swapped up and put something else in, this will tell you right away, oh, something else is in. And again, the second reason is to open them up so that they steep uniformly. All right. Team Master put on three minutes. And it's a beautiful... Half the leaves up, half the leaves down. So let's continue talking about opulent for a minute. So it comes from this area near the Yellow Mountains. So part of that, there's, there's a legend or a history behind this. Remembering that this is ancient bush, this small patch of Tea, old tea bushes that produces opulent used to be tribute tea. And it was sent to the emperor 
And for a number of years, Empire was really aware of this tea and really liked it. And then because there was a change in dynasty. So this was being sent to the emperor during the Ming dynasty. So for those of you who are historians, the Ming was roughly 1368 to 1644, give or take a few years on each end. And at the end of the Ming dynasty, when the Manchus took over and it became the Qing dynasty, the families, and there were just a few of them in this area that cultivated and sent the, oh, and by the way, they were all surnamed Wu. So they were probably all related. Stop sending the tea to the court because they didn't like the change, the dynastic change. So what happened to the process? Does this mean that the Wu's, you know, I'm unhappy with government. You know what? I'm just not going to send any tribute. Well, essentially, that's what they said to themselves. However, it doesn't mean that they stopped processing the tea. That being said, over the years, the craft of processing this tea disappeared. So when it disappeared, it disappeared with users, not users, but producers who knew how to do this particular tea. So in 2000 or 2001, scientific researchers went around and interviewed people. And they found a gentleman who was 99 years old. And this story will continue in a minute. Time is up. That was three minutes. No, tea master's not in a hurry, but she's delivered, making sure everything is in order. Watch her hand technique or wrist technique or arm technique. It's more a wrist technique. All right, and part of that technique is so you don't create a lot of bubbles. Don't want to create a lot of bubbles. And you know, if you end up creating a lot of bubbles, don't worry about it. We talk about all of these things. Do details matter? At the end of the day, they matter. But do they matter? Will the tea go bad if a detail is missed? The answer is no. So don't be nervous about this stuff. Just be aware. There's two, there's a difference here. And if you miss something, you miss something. It does not matter. All right. This tea is so good, it overcomes everything. So before we really enter the quality arena, knowing how greedy I am, I'm gonna smell this thing first. And this is a 170 degree sniff. So that means you can smell more. And there's some distinctive things right away that you'll notice about this. I'm not going to tell you because you're going to tell me. All right, so let's go to the tea itself. Oh, look at that color. That is a beautiful color. Yours should look somewhat like this. The closer, the better. So what I'm going to do, 170 degrees sip, so that means you can in take more, cover my tongue, and we're entering the quality arena. Because we want to know, does this tea belong at Sophie's? Let's see. So, Remembering that the first thing I'm doing is getting the tea liquid in my mouth and I'm trying to evaluate several things. First off, where is the dryness, if any? Second off, is the, is it thick? Is it dense? Is it thin? Is it fleeting? These things you're all trying to determine right away. 
then you're going to swallow. And from the swallow, you're going to say to yourself, what is the aftertaste? Lastly, you're going to do energetics. So one of our friends asked, well, what if I don't feel energetics? Don't worry. This is not a critical component. And remembering that we're all built differently, we're going to feel energetics in a different way. And sometimes we're not going to feel the energetics. Nothing wrong with us. We're just built differently. So we look for, but we don't worry about energetics. And again, knowing that I'm somehow enjoying this, I'm going to take a second sip. So again, note the speed. This is T rhythm. We're not in a hurry. We are trying to make sure that we get as clear an understanding right from the get-go. And then that's what we're, and what's the understanding again? We have two types of understandings, the quality arena understandings, and then an understanding of the aroma and the flavor profiles. So it is your turn to brew and the team master will go ahead and brew with you. So set up your tableau much as she has. Make sure you set the timer for three minutes. Your water should already be somewhere around 175 and you're gonna go ahead and structure that water. But before you even think about structuring, you're gonna make sure all, both cups, all three cups are heated and in a way rinsed. I, I know everybody comes to the table with, with great clean cups. So this isn't an insulting comment about ability to handle cleanliness. This is more a reminder that even the best of us, some little elements of things somehow get stuck on a cup and that can influence flavor. And you're trying to get the best flavor possible. And also, by the way, you are going to end up heating the leaf. So all of this fits into a pattern that we use and is part of heating, and it's very important. And you notice Team Master has rhythm, not in a hurry, not, not fast, not slow, making sure that everything is complete. You take your bag labeled number one, opulent, make sure that, did I do one more pour so that that cup has, is, Thoroughly heated, and you put the leaves in, put the leaves in. And you notice she has this motion of touching the cup. Now, in a way, it looks like she's maybe playing around or trying to distract your attention. And the answer is neither of those things. One of the ways and one of the things you'll learn as you're doing this is you want to eventually be able to touch any cup that you're using and know approximately what the heat profile is. And you do this by practicing. And we all practice by first off, understand 170 degree water. Okay, well, I'll measure that with the thermometer. Oh, it's really 170. Okay. And then You'll touch, okay, what does 170 feel like? And you'll find it feels very different than a 212. And so this is how you keep yourself from making errors. So these are all techniques. And again, these details matter over time. Oh, and we set the timer. Uh, yes, we did set the timer. And we continue with this legend. So... 
Chinese scientists, and, and let me catch you up again to this legend. Remember that in the year 2000 or 2001, the Chinese Academy of Sciences was making a big effort around China, around everywhere in China to capture on film, if possible, the methodology for making each of the teas, because they realized that they were losing some of these methodologies because the market forces were reshaping what farmers would, would do. And so let me explain that statement again, because how do market forces affect farmers? Well, it's pretty simple. If you're making yellow tea, for example, and it takes you four days to finish the process, and because yellow tea isn't universally known across China, and because it's not universally drunk across China, the market for that never exploded. And so you're making, and you're making X amount of money. And so all of a sudden, an LCS agent comes to your door and says, hey, bro, I can help you make a lot more money. Now, all of us are interested in cryptocurrency. Oh, wait a minute. That wasn't the right word. There were interested in schemes or ideas, I should say, to make more money. And so the person says to you, we'll still label your tea as yellow and we'll talk about the rarity of it, rarity of it. And all I want you to do is give me the tea after you've finished the first pass. Of it. So, you know, within 18 hours. So you've reduced your time from four days to 18 hours and you've reduced your storage requirements. Who wouldn't take that as an opportunity? So that's what I mean by market forces. All right, your timer has gone off and you're going to carefully transfer the tea liquid. Get that last drop out because you like the second and the third cups. And it's going to look like this, this one here. All right. And so you're going to go through quality arena evaluation. But before you do, you're going to smell this thing. And remember, you smell the dry leaves. So you already had an impression. You not only smelt the dry leaves, but you also got the intensity level, whatever that was. Yes? First comment, the color is exceptional. Color is exceptional is the first comment. And I absolutely agree. This is one of my favorite red tea colors and because the color, the smell, the flavor, they match. Usually some element fools you. Not here. Every element is aligned. Oh, it's opulent. Rich. Now, I'm not trying to influence what you end up telling. I'm just telling you how the origin of that name. Steeped leaves smell rich and even floral. The steep liqueur, however, is super clean. Steep leaves are rich and floral in aroma, but the actual liquor is very clean. And I love this comment for a lot of reasons because, you know, the fact that you all are starting to use the terminology clean is really important because you now get that. In the beginning, when we used the word, oh, it's really clean. Many of you were thinking, clean. Well, I certainly didn't use dishwater. I'm glad, glad that. <laughs> it has to do with that freshness. And the commentator, the other thing I like about this, that the commentator got these 
essences right away. There wasn't a lot of thought. It, right away, it strikes you. There is no doubt about this. Yes. Dry leaves and wet leaves um, both smell bright. Dry leaves and wet leaves are both bright from an aroma standpoint. And that's absolutely true. You, you recall when I lost self-control a few minutes ago, when the tea master uh, heated up the dry leaves and I was standing four feet away, I said, oh my gosh, I smell that over here. That was the brightness and the intensity of those leaves. A bright gold color, the dry leaves smell of dried fruit like dates. Had a hard time uh, identifying aroma of wet leaves. Took the taste, mellow honey, bright and refreshing. Taste, mellow honey, bright and refreshing. Great comment. And the commentator took me from start all the way down to that taste because the dry leaves released immediately a strong smell. Which adjective uh, did they use for that? Um, dates. Uh, right. Dates, yes, dried dates. Uh, really a nice description because dates, especially metal dates, you got that sweetness. As soon as you put out there, yeah, it's got uh, smell and sweetness. Date is a good comparison. I detected a hint of raspberry aroma in the dried leaves. Hint of raspberry aroma in the dried leaves. Love this comment as well. And I'll tell you why I love this comment. I wouldn't have used raspberry, but I completely get it because it's sweet, distinct, big, bright. And so as I think of that, I also, yes, I see raspberry and I see where that comes from. Good catch. Mouth feel immediately cooling and thinning is tightening on the mouth while the thickness of them is lingering below mouth beneath the cooling. Mouth feel is uh, thick. The, there is a tightness in the mouth. And, and that tightness, by the way, the way I would talk about that tightness, and I, I get the fact you didn't use a dryness because it's actually a combination of dry and kind of thick. So I like the word uh, tight in this context. And at the end, what was the last part of that? A lingering floral. Uh, lingering. And the, it was the um, finish is a tight. Uh, the finish is tightening, okay? And a lingering floral beneath the cooling. Wonderful description because all of you are getting that there's nothing hidden about this. There's this tea, while it has subtleties underneath, it is not subtle to start with. To start with, that brightness immediately captures you. And it says, hey, by the way, if you're thinking of looking for another tea, stop here. Good. No astringency for me. No astringency for the next commentator. And I like this comment as well, because for me, it's an extremely light astringency, nearing no astringency. Yes. A very soft note a very soft mouth. So this is a comment about the quality arena. So we've got thickness, we've got a soft mouth. Love that description. Next, okay. So this tea has a ton going on with it and most of it is forward. Unlike some other teas, um, and by the way, I forgot to say this to you in the beginning. Remember, we're in a red tea extravaganza. So for the next three weeks, we're going to have red teas, but they're going to be different. So I hope that what you're doing is taking good notes because next week we're going to do classic and the week following that we're going to do national treasure and it's going to be a different 
profile, both from the quality arena as well as the aroma and the taste. And again, opulent is the start off because it, it's big, it's bright, it's got lots of great pleasantness. This is a great definition. You could almost say, of course, I'm not going to say this, as if it should be said, but you can almost say that this is a great definition of Anhui Red at the very top level. Sweet honey flavors lingers. Sweet honey flavor lingers. You know, the reason I like this comment so much is because just as I was talking about, this is the definition of a great red on my tea. I was thinking about, yeah, it's still on my tongue. And what's on my tongue is that sweetness and just the pleasantness of the mouthfeel. Juicy, full mouth pleasure, smooth, yes, sort of opulent. Juicy, full mouth pleasure, smooth, and sort of opulent. And again, if you we're designing a tea and you're up there consulting with all the angels. I, and your order is, I want the best red you can make. Uh, uh, wait, you know what? This is pretty much on target. It is so smooth on mouthfeel that I feel drawn in with the promise of things to come. So smooth on mouthfeel that it draws in this commentator because they're anxious to see what follows. Yet those things are so elusive that it leads to an overall roundness. <laughs> so the things that follow are so elusive that what you get instead is a feeling, a feeling of roundness, a feeling of depth, a feeling of encompassment. Or I'm about to fall into the abyss of the depths, depths of the sea. Or this commentator continues, they're about to fall into the abyss of the depths of this tea. Love this comment because what this is really talking about is really the quality arena. When you have a tea, whatever the flavor is, wouldn't you like to fall into the abyss? of the tea, in other words, and get that roundness and the smoothness, wouldn't that like, wouldn't you like that to be the description of every one of your teas? So great catch on this. And I like the fact that you've carefully gone through this and really highlighted the specialness of the depth of it and the thickness and the mysteriousness. And again, we're not, the mysteriousness is not cult mysteriousness. This is the mysteriousness of an experience which leaves you wanting more. All right, so we were talking about legend and we were also talking about the Chinese National Academy of Science Sciences, where they're trying to film every tea process for posterity and trying to set it up so farmers in the future, if they want to go back to a certain process, will have the ability to do that. So this is why they went to this village and they found this 99-year-old who was not actually doing the tea but remember the steps to this. And that's how this tea came back to life because they worked it. So the scientist in conjunction with a local farmer there took down all the information and then worked over a number of years to develop the process to produce this tea. Now, of course, it always helps if you start out with good stock. And this is great stock because as I said, it's old bush between 300 and 500 or old small tree, 300 to 500 years old for 
quite a bit of time, probably not regularly tended. So there's an element of wildness, but you would not call this wild tree because it has been tended on and off during this time. There've just been some off times. When you have off times, what does that mean? The plants have to fend for themselves and it's the strongest of them that make it because that area, there's lots of other plants, lots of other vegetation. There is no development in that area. In other words, you don't have factories aside from tea production facilities in that area. So this is this gives you a little sense of this terroir and it's a beautiful area. So again, think close to the Yellow Mountains. Think also varietals, which are all part of what they use in the Chimun family. And then think about the fact that there are quite a few legends associated with this type of tea. So let me tell you another legend as well. And maybe it's true and maybe it's not. So you remember that there was a Britisher, Robert Fortune. And he went to China and procured, this is a nice way of saying, stole. Chinese base material, tea material. So seeds, cuttings, and he did it twice. And so the traditional tale, and I've told parts of this tale before, is that he went to the Wuyi Mountains, stole or gathered cuttings, seeds, kidnapped some workers from that area, and went back to India. The British ultimate, and he was hired by the British, the ultimate objective was to get Britain away from having to pay the Chinese for tea. They loved tea, but they didn't like the expense of it. And so they thought, well, if we can just get some of this over in India, which is our colony, we can exploit this. And so that was real underlying purpose of sending Robert Fortune to China. What most people don't know is he took a second trip and one of the places he got cuttings from is exactly this area, Xuning. So there's three places, the Wuyi Mountains, Ningbo, which is in Zhejiang, Southern Zhejiang province, and then Xuning, which is in Anhui. And that's just not well known, but the Chinese have done really good research. They don't, um, and by the way, where did most of those end up? Most of those cuttings and seeds and plantings end up? They ended up in Darjeeling, India. So the, the Chinese have done a, a, a quite a bit of research on this. So they have pretty good evidence for all of these. And the one thing they don't have evidence for, they know that from the same area where this was grown, that he got seeds and cuttings. Nobody knows whether it was exactly this tea. So that's another story associated with this tea. Let me finish the processing and then we'll wrap up. We'll wrap up a little early today. So from a processing modality, this tea goes through normal red tea. So you pick, you wither. How do you wither? You wither both indoors and outdoors. What's the purpose of withering indoors and outdoors? The outdoor withering, you're trying to get some sun dry in that. The indoor withering, you're adding back humidity and Really, at the end of the day, you want the total water content of the leaf to be reduced. And you want it reduced anywhere from 30 to 50%. My goodness, if we were making things like the Hubble telescope, 30, 
the 50% difference in how you made it would be too great. Here though, this is a recipe in the farmer's head and there's that much more variability. Yes. She warms my core. I think it should be a standalone plot to enjoy and ponder and share our practices. So we have a further comment here. Tea warms this individual's core, and that's part of an energetics comment. And the commentator is advocating to make it a single quaff tea, to evaluate just from a single quaff, because it's that rich and good. Agree, warming and company. I agree, I agree. I've been thinking the tea is warming. It's such an easy tea to drink. Very pleasant. Warming and comforting is the next commentator, and it's a really easy tea to drink. There is no question that this is an easy tea to drink. If we weren't doing tea meditation this morning, and you had just ordered up this tea at 9.30, at 9.37, you would have been finished. And you'd have been thinking to yourself, that was really good. But you wouldn't have been able to talk about all the elements that made it really good. You know, someone, one of the com one of you mentioned, and I want to go back to this particular descriptor, juicy. It is warming, juicy, round, full, interesting. This is an incredible red tea. And again, if you have great friends that you're going to have over. It's a rainy day. It's cold outside. And you're thinking, well, what should I give everybody for the afternoon enjoyment? Keep opulent in mind because everybody will enjoy this tea. And there, it, it's hard not to enjoy this particular tea. All right. Yes. Woman spices too. Cinnamon, cardamom, like a nice spiced scone. Oh, this is really good. So this particular commentator is tasted down. And remember, one of you mentioned falling into the abyss and the roundness and the depth because you couldn't quite distinguish. You knew there was other stuff in there. Couldn't quite distinguish, and it developed into that roundness. Well, this particular commentator is making some distinguishing identifications. Hints of spiciness. There are hints of spiciness in this, but it is a secondary. So the floral, honey, sweet, bright, that's right in your face. But the underlying stuff does have that, I believe cardamom, cinnamon uh, were, were pointed out as, as possibilities of how to understand this. Clearly, that's part of this mysteriousness of the underlying flavor of this tea. I'm getting some subtle cinnamon as well. I recall getting notes of cinnamon from other red teas from older trees we've tried too. Notes of cinnamon, subtle, subtle. And this commentator notes that they've gotten that from other older slash ancient trees as well. And uh, this is for red teas, of course. And red tea gives you that opportunity to have this. It, it, and where does that arise? It arises from the varietal, and it also arises from how they oxidize this. Because remembering that even though I haven't gotten through the full process yet, the end step, well, it's not the end step, but one of the important steps is the oxidation. And, you know, you hear tea purveyors say, oh, yes, fully oxidized or uh, you, you hear that a lot. Is this fully oxidized? The answer is no, it's heavily oxidized. That's the correct. 
we accept as a shortcut when people say fully, but it's really heavily. Let me tell you what would happen and why we have to make this distinction if this were fully oxidized. Would you like this tea if it were fully oxidized? I'll help you out with it. It would be sour. You like sour? Not if you're drinking red tea. When it's over oxidized, in quotes, fully oxidized, you get sour. This is not sour. When you heavily oxidize, so let's define heavily oxidized. Anywhere between 90 to 98%. You, you start leaking over 98, you're getting into dangerous territory. You're under 90 then you're in another type of ter territory that's characterized by some of the ancient tree reds. So Tiffany, Black Beauty, where they're under 90. And what the farmer has done on purpose is to give room for further oxidation during the aging process. Most farmers, most production facilities don't do that. And the reason they don't do it is because in this day and age, customers like predictability, except in here. In here, we don't like predictability. We like predictability in terms of quality arena standards, but in terms of flavor from year to year, we love the range of flavors that can be produced. But most tea producers struggle with that range, especially outside of China. They want something that year by year, the customer can say, give me Twin Peaks, you know, the one that tastes like cloves. And every year they can go into the cupboard, here's Twin Peaks, yes. Seems calming. Seems calming. Love that comment about this tea. And this is also connected to the agedness. Most aged tea, and by aged, I mean tea treats. I didn't say that correct. Most old or ancient tea treats produce tea that tends to be settling, calming, grounding. Color of second cup is deeper. Didn't expect that. The color of the second cup is deeper. And this was unexpected. And so, one of the things that's beautiful about this particular tea is this color right off the get-go. And the color, again, matches this com complexity. How many times have you had a tea, especially in here, where color has tricked you and you thought, hmm, it's going to be one way or the other? Not this. This, every step of the way, it's been consistency. Question. Chemistry. Chemistry. The so we'll talk more about chemistry because I don't want to get lost in the weeds with this next week. For classic, I'll devote more time about the chemistry. The there's lots of things to talk about in relationship to chemistry, and there's lots of big words that I would get a chance to use. So you know I'll be excited to do that next week. And in fact, I think what I'll do is I'll send you a list of those words because it's not in our every, everyday vocabulary. But these are all important in understanding how these flavors develop. The basic chemistry, of course, with any red tea is at the end of the road, you gotta have heavy oxidation. And what is the heavy oxidation doing? It's taking the catechins, the polyphenols that are inherent in the tea leaf, and it's changing them through an enzymatic process into other polyphenols. So specifically with red tea, mostly theoflavins and theorubigans. We know that theoflavins influences the briskness of taste. We know that theorubigans influences the color. 
I may have got that backwards. You have one that's taste, one that's color. And by next week, I'll make sure I, I give that to you very precisely. What is important and what we don't yet have a full understanding is exactly how the theorubigans interacts with the body. We're pretty sure, and that's the big thing, scientists are pretty sure that theorubigans Rubicans plays many beneficial roles in your body, but the precision of understanding how or why, that's not there. And there's still a lot of research, particularly around theorubicans. Theoflavins, we have a much better understanding. And again, from the alleged health benefit, next week we'll talk a little bit about that. But part of what you feel in drinking red tea. And the way the Chinese herbalists use it is to calm digestion down. Calming digestion from their perspective means when you've eaten improperly. It doesn't mean stress issues. Stress issues, they advocate other things. Yes. I like the first cup a lot, but love the flavors of the second. So this commentator liked the first cup a lot but then morphed into love by the second cup. The second cup, the colors and the flavors are that much more intense. All right, so um, I'm reluctant, I think. Oh, you know, I'm not reluctant to finish the processing. Let me finish the processing before I jump into anything else. And actually, I'm not going to jump into anything else unless you ask me uh, for this session. So remember, we picked, we've withered. When you're withering, you're trying to get the, the amount of water reduced by 30 to 50%. What you'll notice is that the veins protrude, leaf veins, of course, uh, protrude more as you wither. After withering, there's a rolling process. The rolling, if you're doing it by hand, we've talked about, you use a crosshatch uh, bamboo mat, most uh, red teas these days don't get rolled by hand because it's very, very time consuming and expensive, but some still do, especially as you go deeper into away from uh, civilization. I, I didn't mean it that way. Away from the urban uh, areas. So when you go to Yunnan, lots of that is actually hand rolled. You know, all the ancient tree stuff is hand rolled. So after rolling, what you're doing is you're getting all the volatile essences and juices to the pour, and then you pile, or you let it oxidize. And how do you let it oxidize? Several different ways. But generally speaking, is you pile it any way from about eight, uh, anywhere from about eight inches up to about two or three feet. That is your putting the tea on top of uh, itself. And you do this in a temperature controlled environment. Why is it temperature controlled? Because remember oxidation occurs in the bell curve. Let's talk about that bell curve. What's the peak of that bell curve? 88 point something degrees. If you go towards 150, you flatten out that bell curve. You exceed 150, you denature the enzymatic uh, compound or the enzyme. As you go towards 32, you flatten out. So the farmers all have a recipe somewhere between 32 and 150. Nobody's cl ever close to 32. So it's closer. The range is more between 75 and about 100. That's classically where you would find yourself where you would not find yourself, but find most farmers who are processing this tea. After oxidizing it to the degree that you think it's done, you got to do two things. So in this particular case, they do a light smokeless roast. And that is to reduce the moisture even more. And then the final step is in an oven to rebake. 
why do you rebate? Here, you need precision. If you allow more than 8% of the uh, moisture in the leaf to remain, what's going to happen is the tea will spoil after about three months. And if you're going to export this, are you kidding me? Customs will look and say, what happened? You forgot to go to tea class? Don't you know you can't take stuff out of here that's more than 8%? Fail. And it rejects the entire batch, even if it was only one small part that you meant that you forgot to get down to 8% or less. So that's why you do the rebake and it is very precise. All right. As usual, all of you have uh, provided wonderful commentary about this team. And both Shelby and I believed that this would be a big hit among the group because we like this so much ourselves. And we, for the same reasons that you all mentioned, find it a really interesting red tea. So that was a great job. Hopefully you've taken great notes because next week we'll continue on the red teas. And we're gonna go from Anhui down to Yuna. And so we're gonna talk about the differences between Anhui and Yuna because there's some obvious differences. So for this week, I hope you have a very safe week. You know, everything that we're seeing about COVID, the new variants says it's become extremely transmissible. So I encourage everybody to be careful because uh, we're seeing a number of people get sick. So stay healthy and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye now.